Our next guest, I had the pleasure of working with her already. Please welcome Denise Duve from Block Size Capital and Lukas Zeringer from Verity Tracking. They will hold a keynote on tokenization and trading of high quality carbon credits, a market with momentum. And again, if you want to reach out to the staff, to us, to me, use LinkedIn or the Telegram group. I'm, uh, we are thrilled to answer your questions, to even give you a peek behind the scenes that's planned, that's coming. And I think everything is set up. Denise, over to you. Thanks, Marcel. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having us. Hi, my name is Denise Doof. I'm work as strategic advisor ESG for the Block Size Mikobo Group. Block Size is specialized in digital asset management and trading and Mikobo in tokenization. And together with my colleague, Luca Zeringer, I'm talking uh, about tokenization and trading of high quality carbon credits. Whereas I'm going to lay a little bit of the foundation, Luca is making the whole thing a little bit more tangible on the biofuel example we are currently working on. Yeah, cool. So, we are talking about climate change for a very, very long time now. But reactions have been kind of slow. But something is changing now, because for every major capital intense change to happen, you actually do need three things. You do need political readiness, you do need market readiness, and you do need investment readiness. And that is what we're seeing. We see political readiness, so we see ambitious decarbonization targets and strategy like the one from the EU Fit for 55 or the proposed SEC rule for emission disclosure and exposure for climate change-related risk, because climate change increasingly is a financial risk. And we do see market readiness. So we see companies feel increasing pressure for decarbonization, because they are afraid if they are not tackling this topic, they are going to lose out in market share and in talent. And we also see investment readiness. So climate tech grew at five times the rate of global startup funding overall in the last 10 years. So actually what we are seeing is an unprecedented business case for climate issues. And this has impacts on the voluntary carbon market as well. But before I'm going to talk about the voluntary carbon markets, I make a short excursion to the scientific basics just, just to lay a little bit of the foundation. So as everything else in nature, carbon flow, the carbon flow is a cycle. So it flows through the air, the atmosphere, ocean, living components, and so on. And what's currently happening is that the flow is interrupted because we are pumping up carbon quicker back into the system as it can be absorbed. And this leads to the amplification of the greenhouse gas effect, ecosystem degradations, ocean acidifications, and so on. And we do need to tackle this, and we do need to tackle this quickly to reach this 1.5% target everybody is talking about as the uh, graph on the right-hand side suggests. So we do need to tackle this from all sides. We do need to restore nature, our ecosystem, back to a maximum carbon sequestration capacity. So we do need to protect them, and we do need to restore ecosystems. And we do need emission reductions, so we need Economy, circular economy approaches, we do need to reduce waste and so on. And we do need to push green tech. And that is where the voluntary carbon market comes in. Because the voluntary carbon market is doing exactly that if it is facilitated in the right way. It commoditizes CO2 emissions and reductions or ecosystem services for that matter. It brings together demand and supply, so demand in form of emission that can't be reduced yet because we don't have the technology yet, for example, with the supplies so with, with projects that actually protect our ecosystem, restore our ecosystems, or push green tech. And it reduces marginal abatement costs. For decarbonization in total, the costs come down if you use the market. And it supports new technologies because it is generating financing finances there. And we do see an evolving voluntary carbon market, but it still faces some challenges because it is very fragmented. It is fragmented in terms of value, 
of the candidates out there, and it is fragmented in terms of structure. So for a carbon credit to be, have any value, it actually needs to fulfill certain criteria. And it's a complex system, because nature is a complex system, so it needs to be additional. It needs to be something which shouldn't have happened anyways. And it needs to be permanent. So they say for a carbon reduction or removal to have any impact, it needs to be out of the atmosphere longer than 100 years. And some standards actually do have the threshold of 100 years, but others only have fives. So the quality is very different. And a lot of carbon credits come with additional criteria, the additional sustainability criteria that add extra value. So it is very fragmented. And the structure is very fragmented because we have various standards, we have various registries, we do see brokers, traders, retailers in this market, and actually, most of the deals are currently done over the counter. So in the end, that means that many fees are going to intermediaries, not to the projects themselves. We do not have any price signals because the market is so fragmented. And there's a high reputational risk. A high reputational risk because you may offset your carbon removal or your carbon emissions, you compensate them, within credit, credit has had, that has no inherent value because actually no real reduction happened. And I also want to shortly address the, the many um, DLT projects that attract so many attention in the last months. So um, they're great because actually they are making uh, the, the carbon credits more accessible and they generated a lot of noise, but what they're actually doing, most of them, they take already issued credits and put them on chain. However, remember the complexity and the quality aspect here. So to have an actual impact, you do need to know that the, the, the credit has quality and this, can only be done if we can cover the whole ecosystem. And this can be done through tokenization, cradle to crave, to actually use blockchain and environmental lingo combined. Because through to tokenization smart contracts, we can include business logic, we can include regulatory insights, and we actually can integrate data from along the whole value chain pre and post-trade. And what's that, what does this mean in the end? It allows for full transparency combined with ownership along the whole value chain. So it means that project developers or participants in every system can actually monetize their actual ESG contribution. And that is what you want, right? You do want to incentivize people to work towards those high-quality carbon credits and you want to make it investable. And we can do this efficient and accurate because we can integrate other measurement systems and we can integrate other technologies. And this, in turn, gives us the basis actually to create product categories because we can integrate and we know data, we can gather the data from the beginning, from the, the creation of the emission reduction along the whole value chain. So in the end, we actually know what happened. So we end up with a trusted credit. And this is where we see the potential of DLT combined with tokenization, because it allows us for standardized, high quality, verifiable and transferable assets. And we already see a lot of interested buyers out there actually seeking access to those quality credits. And with DLT also, we have, can easily integrate and give access to the trading value, venue. And this is what we would see as the foundation for an efficient, scalable market for all relevant participants, including institutional investors. So I'm handing over to Luca now, who is discussing the whole thing on the biofuel example. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Lucas. I'm the lead Europe for Verity. And I think um, I will not repeat that traceability 
is very important when it comes to carbon and sustainability markets. Uh, so I'm glad to show a um, real example applied in the case of the biofuel, how we can actually do that in practice. Um, so the talk will uh, focus on the biofuel case and how do we ensure supply of high quality carbon and ESG assets. And well, we like to talk a lot about technology and tokenization. That doesn't really look like tokenization <laughs> up there uh, because we think the starting point of um, uh, basically um, mobilizing markets and finance for sustainability outcomes should be understanding nature, ecosystem, and economic behaviors, right? And we should not talk trading and market first for sustainability outcomes. Well, what you see here, and you don't need to be a scientist, is basically carbon poor soil on the left and carbon rich uh, soil on the right. This is a result of 200 years of certain economic behaviors and farming pr practices have led to the depletion of organic matter in our soil. The good news is that we have possibilities today and instruments to reverse it and to restore carbon in the soil. It's not only good for uh, the food quality because you'll have more nutrients in your food products, but it's also good because we can use this incredible opportunity of having farmlands as natural sink to capture CO2 in farm uh, soils. It's estimated in the EU only that we can sequester up to 20% of their emissions until 2050 by using regenerative agriculture practices um, in, in, in our farms. And the other good news is that we know about these practices. Uh, you have two examples here, reducing tillage or having, uh, adding cover crops uh, on the fields. And again, I'm really talking about nature because this is what it is to um, make an effective change. The issue is that for a farmer to switch to these practices is that it takes time, it's a cost, it's an investment, so a farmer would need incentives and rewards to switch to these practices. Um, and this is where carbon credits and carbon market can play a huge role and there's a big interest from our ministries and um, EU commission to uh, push for uh, this type of practices and instruments and where blockchain and tokenization can help. And the same goes with our uh, fuels that will power our flights and cars and transportation means in the future. And I think that's in the middle of the debate right now with the Ukraine crisis and war. Um, do we have sustainable and um, uh, you know, convenient and efficient alternatives to fossil fuel? And are we sure that these fuels are actually more sustainable than the baseline, which is on the left, and they are actually co causing uh, less harm um, to, to, to the environment? And this is where you realize that the traceability of the carbon intensity is so important. So now going more in details, how do we do this uh, exactly? We started the journey with Givo two years ago, um, which is a US biofuel producer. Um, and together with BlockSize and uh, Mikobo, we basically created Verity as a spin-off um, and a dedicated solution and platform for the market. The activity of Givo is to turn uh, feedstocks, to ferment them, create alcohols such as isobutanol or ethanol for different markets, replacing, for example, fuels for the aviation, but also creating other products like green plastics and also co-products, which are interesting, for example, uh, corn oil for the food markets or also proteins from corn that you can directly feed back to the livestock. So it's a whole circular economy model, and you understand why the carbon value is really in the core of, the, of their uh, mindset. So together with Givo, we thought, how can we create a chain of custody using the blockchain to record all the inputs, all the carbon attributes and the carbon intensity score from field to flight, I say to flight in the example of an airline consuming the biofuel. And we didn't want to use for that paper-based reporting and, you know, Roth modeling where an auditor would go on site once a year and we don't really know what's happening. That's basically the baseline today. We wanted to do an automated life cycle assessment by connecting to the source data directly and building the ecosystem of partners that give us access to this data. So sensor data, IoT, satellite imagery, these are the type of things we're collecting at the feedstock level and then we continue um, down until the intermediate transport and the consumer. So let's see how it works, for example, at the farm level. Uh, we just announced a quite big partnership with the Precision 
a farming company in the US called Farmer's Edge, which is actually um, giving us access to the whole range of data at the farm level. So for example, the yield, the energy use from farming devices, uh, the practices, the chemicals. We are tracking the upstream and downstream um, components, the emissions and the, the, the chemical values, and we are calculating the life cycle assessment models. For that, we use different scientific models that are based on recognized model or IPCC data, for example. Um, and we have the exact carbon intensity score down to the bushel level. Uh, you can see here it's uh, expressed in grams of GHG, which is carbon um, CO2 equivalent gases per bushel, and that will be transformed into megajoule, which is the unit of value for a biofuel. Um, <clears throat> we continue after the feedstock level down um, the process, and basically we record the uh, incoming data as well as the carbon intensity scores on the blockchain with different uh, components being accessible publicly or with uh, permission access. So what you understand from this approach is basically for the feedstock growers, the farmers, but also for Givo that takes these feedstocks and turn it into biofuel, they have a very verified and proven and traceable carbon intensity score, which is the basis for um, carbon credit claim. Um, or whatever carbon certificates that could be issued. And the good thing with these claims is that they cannot be manipulated, they cannot be double counted, and this is one of the big issues we have in the market at the moment. These claims can be tokenized and offered um, on carbon markets for buyers and investors, but they can also be bought, for example, to the um, airline company that needs low carbon biofuel, but also they may want to compensate for the emissions by buying the tokens um, and the credits attributed to the biofuel value chain. And then if you push the logic a little bit further, the airline company can sell back these credits um, to their clients, may it be Microsoft or individual passengers. Yeah, so to conclude, we have a few benefits for the entire industry, uh, creating incentives and revenues for sustainable farming, offering differentiated low carbon products in the market and generating premium credits, which you can turn into tradable uh, digital assets, um, providing more trust for buyers and investors in that field. So Verity is building the infrastructure exactly for that. Uh, basically, the goal is to mobilize finance and market for sustainability outcomes. From the left, the tracking of carbon and sustainability projects um, until basically the mobilization of uh, the markets. And this can be done in biofuels, but also natural gas, green hydrogen, or further sustainability assets. And yeah, we're happy to talk about more people who would have questions or uh, requests and suggestions on how to further develop this technology. Thank you so much. <laughs>